So question 131 is straight up a fact question. What is the function of the left atrium? The answer is B, yes. Um, you will have questions like this that seem really straightforward, anatomy-related. It technically falls under the cardiac portion of your National Registry test, but um, it's really, really basic. You have to know that blood goes into the right side from the body and blood goes into the left side from the lungs and how all of the rest of the anatomy ties in there. Number 132. A 49-year-old male with an extensive cardiac history presents with two hours of crushing chest pain and shortness of breath. He is pale and diaphoretic and tells you that he feels like he's going to die. His medications include nitroglycerin, Viagra, and Vasotec. His blood pressure is 140 over 90, and his heart rate is 110 beats per minute. In addition to administering 100% oxygen, what should you do? So yeah, so in this case, the answer is D. Um, why would you not want to do A or C yet? Yeah, he, if he has prescribed Viagra, you know that Viagra is a contraindication. You know that window of time is 24 hours. We had a question earlier on in this review where it was, had a 72-hour window question, and that one's not correct. 24 hours is the appropriate window that you want to be careful of. Viagra, and remember, any other um, nitrate-containing medications that are used for this similar process. Viagra is the main one that we talk about because that's what you'll see more patients that actually have. Cialis is 72. Cialis is 72? Okay. There you go. So it will depend. But for Viagra specifically, it's 24. Not that I know that by <laughs> personal experience. Awkward. It's a protocol that we have. Question number 133. Yeah, we're not going to edit that out of the little recording. So <laughs> You respond to a call for an unknown emergency. When you arrive at the scene, the patient's husband meets you at the door and states that his wife has been depressed and has locked herself in an upstairs bedroom. He further tells you that he keeps a, his 45 caliber handgun in the bedroom. What should you do? B is the only good answer in this case. Uh, we had a really similar question to this. I think it was number 106. Um, and the appropriate choice is always to stay safe and get law enforcement involved. You don't ever do C. I, I said it then, I'll say it now. You don't ever get in your ambulance and just leave. Uh, but you also shouldn't try to handle it yourself or try to have somebody who's not trained handle it. Number 134. A 49-year-old male presents with an acute onset of crushing chest pain and diaphoresis. What should you do? Let's look at A. Administer up to 324 milligrams of baby aspirin. Would that be a reasonable uh, intervention for this patient? Maybe, yeah, okay. What about administer up to three doses of nitro? Red flag there because you don't know anything about whether or not he's prescribed. So if it doesn't say clearly in the question that they have that prescription, that one's always going to be wrong. You're never going to assume that they have it if it's not clearly stated. Uh, what about C? Obtain vital signs in a sample history. That would be something you would do for a patient, sure. What about D, assess the adequacy of his respirations? That would also be something you would do. So when we look at this, which of these things would we do first? Check breathing and airway, get vital signs, or give him a drug? Yeah. Airway, airway and breathing. So the answer to this one is D. Um, mo most of the choices were good, but they weren't correct in terms of the very first thing you should do. Sometimes you almost have to think too basically, like... You want to start thinking about the way you'd actually treat this person when in reality it's asking you, do you know the process on how we evaluate somebody, like on the very, very basic uh, steps. Number 150, 135, excuse me. You respond to an office building to find a middle-aged male in cardiac arrest. Coworkers are performing CPR and state that the patient has been down for approximately 10 minutes. You attach the AED, push the analyze button, and receive a shock-advised message. What should you do? A, this is one of those, we've had similar questions, this one is super basic. You make sure that nobody's touching the patient, you have to say clear, and then you shock your patient. If the AD says shock, you shock. It's as simple as that. No extra thinking is really required at that point. Number 136, 
The two processes that occur during respiration are what? B is the best answer, inspiration and expiration. So it's basically talking. I, I, I remember a few days ago we kind of talked about the difference between ventilation and respiration, how ventilation is more of the mechanical process of air in, air out, and respiration can really refer to like the movement of gases in between, like alveoli to blood vessels, things like that. Um, but here it's clearly using the word respiration, but it's asking about breathing in general, not specifically one versus another, but overall. And in that case, inspiration and expiration make sense. None of the others have two terms that would accurately describe any part of the process. Uh, we do talk about how diffusion is like the movement of things, uh, of um, oxygen, but again, it's not, it's not put together in a way that makes that the correct answer, either of those times the correct answer. I didn't want to confuse you all with what I'd said before. Number 137. The term behavioral crisis is most accurately defined as what? Can we say it? So in this case, the answer choice is B, because that's straight up a dictionary definition from your book. Number 138. You suspect that a six-year-old girl has broken her leg after falling from a swing at a playground. Shortly after you arrive, the child's mother appears and refuses to allow you to continue treatment. What should you do? So when you have a consent issue with a minor, minor being someone under 18, um, how do you handle that? Who has the ability to legally give consent or refuse treatment? The yeah, the parent, the guardian, I guess, generally speaking. We usually think of it in terms of parents, but it could be someone else who actually has legal guardianship. Uh, the kid can't make that choice for themselves. When do we know that somebody under age 18 can make choices for themselves? There's a couple specific times. Pregnancy, yeah, a pregnant female, and an emancipated minor. Um, if you've gone through the legal process, then they're no longer your legal guardians, and therefore they legally don't have that power to give consent for you. In this case, that doesn't apply. She's six years old. Um, and so the mother does have the right to give consent, yeah? So based on that, we can't actually treat the patient. Um, a doesn't work because implied consent, what does that apply to? Implied consent applies to situations where you can't get legal consent. So if there's a child and there's no mother around, or if somebody is unconscious or um, incapable of giving consent for one of the reasons we've talked about, intoxication, um, things like that. In that case, you have to do the implied consent, which is basically, you know, do your standard of care, do the very best thing that you know how to do that any other EMT in your same situation would do. Uh, that doesn't apply here. B, try to persuade the mother that treatment is needed. Okay, that, that's a good one. C, ask the mother to sign a refusal form and then leave. Between B and C, which is the better way to handle this? Definitely B, yeah. Um, you don't... You don't just drop it and let go, generally speaking. Because, again, part of it with consent is not only expressed consent, but also informed consent. They have to know what's going on. What about D? Tell the mother that her refusal is a form of child abuse. No. That is not something for you to decide or judge on. Um, if it comes down to that, it's an issue for the courts. It's certainly not your job to do that or say that. You could open yourself up to all kinds of legal issues. For um, You'd be sued just for... People could claim um, harassment or emotional distress or you know, fill in the blank, whatever. So the, the answer choice in this case is B. Try to persuade the mother that treatment is needed. That's the best you can do is just to give them all the information and try to hopefully get them to choose what you think is the best choice. And at the end of the day, if they choose not to make that choice, you have to document everything thoroughly. You do have to get them to sign it. Um, and then you need to make sure that it's well documented in your report with witnesses um, that that's exactly what happened. It's a, it's a whole process. Number 139. You receive a call for a 70-year-old female with respiratory distress. Her husband tells you that she has congestive heart failure. However, he does not think that she has been taking her medications as prescribed. The patient is laboring to breathe, appears tired, and has cyanosis around her lips. What should you do? So in this case, the answer choice is A, assist her ventilations with a BVM. Um, clearly, she needs oxygen. That's indicated by the stuff we know about her from the question. All of these sort of include oxygen, except for D, so we can cancel D out completely. And between a non-rebreather or a BVM, which one makes more sense? BVM, because she's laboring to breathe. She has cyanosis around her lips. 
clearly she's not getting enough oxygen by herself. Uh, that laboring to breathe specifically talks about how she's actually having trouble with the mechanical process. And so oxygen by itself, just with an honorary breather, isn't necessarily going to be enough. She needs actual help with the breathing, the mechanical side of it, too. Number 140. While, assessing, while assisting a paramedic in the attempted resuscitation of a 55-year-old male in cardiac arrest, you should expect the paramedic to do what? Um... This isn't really a question that applies to you because it's asking about paramedic stuff. I'll go ahead and tell you guys the answer is B. Um, in this case, you can sort of look at the other options. So if you look at A, give the patient nitroglycerin to increase his blood pressure. What's wrong with that one? What does nitroglycerin do? Drops blood pressure. So right then and there, that's totally nonsensical. C, give the patient activated charcoal to rule out a drug overdose. This wouldn't make sense. A patient who's in cardiac arrest, are they conscious? Are they able to swallow? You would not give a patient activated charcoal if they're not conscious and able to swallow. The whole, the whole question or the whole answer doesn't even make sense to rule out a drug overdose. Totally not how we use that particular medication. Uh, but you also wouldn't give it to this kind of patient anyway. And then D, withhold drug therapy until an interosseous catheter is in place. Remember, interosseous or IO, that's into the bone. Um, and those are actually better than IVs in some ways. They get the drug in there faster, um, and they take a little bit less precision. I mean, you're going into the bone, but it's very simple process versus trying to find uh, the appropriate blood vessel that you can get a good line in and things like that. However, do you think a, a, any answer choice where somebody is just told to wait or to not do something, those are never the answer choices that we're supposed to choose. So in this case, B is the one that would make sense, and B is the one that we would go with. Number 141. While en route to the scene of a shooting, the dispatcher advises you that the caller states that the perpetrator has fled the scene. What should you do? Yeah, so this question is a little bit um, confusing, I guess. I feel like there's a lot of things that sort of have to be assumed to answer this one properly. The answer, as best I could kind of discern, is supposed to be B in this case. Confirm this information with the law enforcement personnel at the scene. Uh, what this is making you assume, though, is that it's a shooting so law enforcement personnel has already been called out. And that's a reasonable assumption to make, which is why I feel like B is still the best choice, but it, it is an assumption that you have to make. Uh, C wouldn't be a bad choice if there was no law enforcement, and that's, that's why I flipped over to B based on that. Um, D, again, isn't a bad choice. Like I said, none of these are really, except for A, because he, the dispatcher doesn't know all that extra stuff. Um, none of the others are really bad choices. And so, I don't know, when we do this one for real, for making a really nice review, we're probably going to cut this one out, because I think it's a bad question. But the answer is supposed to be B. Number 142. You were dispatched to a residence where a middle-aged man was found unconscious in his front yard. There are no witnesses that can tell you what happened. You find him in a prone position. His eyes are closed, and he is not moving. Your first action should be What? Okay, so the key to getting this one right is to read the question really, really carefully. I'm going to read that last, like, third sentence, I guess, again. You find him in a prone position. His eyes are closed, and he is not moving. So what does your patient look like? He's lying down how? On his front, right? Can you do anything to help your patient when they're lying on their front? You have to roll them over. Um, if the rolling over wasn't a choice, then you'd have to choose what was next best in terms of your ABCs kind of thing. But in this case, the answer is B, because you can't open his airway while he's on his front. You can't do that maneuver. It's impossible. Um, you really can't properly assess his breathing while he's on his front because it looks different. When we assess for breathing, we look for rise and fall of the chest, and his chest is down on the ground, and so you'd be looking at it differently, and it's not going to look the same. And again, carotid pulse, yes, you could take it, but really, to treat this patient, you're going to have to roll him over. So you'd want to go ahead and do that first. Just get him in a proper position, and then you can do all of your assessment at once. Number 143. You receive a call to a residence where a neighbor has found the resident, a 40-year-old female, semi-conscious on her living room floor. During your assessment, you discover a bottle of Dilantin on a nearby table. You should be most suspicious that this patient... What? 
Uh, this is another one of those questions that isn't super applicable to the EMT side of things because you're not going to be expected to know a whole bunch of extra drugs. You might see this as one of those beta questions on the test where they kind of want to see what you do and don't know. In this case, the answer is C, because dilantin is a drug that is given to treat epileptics. So in this case, knowing that she has that medication and if you know what it means, you'd assume she might have had a seizure because remember that postictal phase is when they're kind of coming out of a seizure, you're going to see depressed breathing as in slower, uh, less breathing, semi-consciousness, it'll eventually improve, you just kind of have to wait it out. Number 144. A 37-year-old male is having a severe allergic reaction to penicillin. He does not have an epinephrine auto-injector or anakit, and your protocols do not allow you to carry such drugs on the ambulance. How should you proceed with the treatment of this patient? So if we look at the answer choices, why is A automatically wrong? We don't mess with Benadryl. It is not one of the drugs that we deal with as EMT basics. Um, choice number B, or choice letter B, it's not a number, sorry. Administer oxygen, transport at once, and request a paramedic rendezvous. Are there any real problems with this particular answer choice? No, I mean, nothing in there is incorrect. You would want to administer oxygen. You would want to transport it once. Remember, this patient is having, it says severe allergic reaction. It doesn't say anaphylaxis, and sometimes they'll use those terms interchangeably, and sometimes they can kind of mean slightly different things, but you should be thinking, okay, anaphylaxis or near to it, maybe if not exactly everything. Um, there's just not enough detail. But you do know that you'd want to give oxygen. You want to transport it once because you have nothing that you can treat this guy with. Um, and requesting a paramedic rendezvous, why might that be a good idea? because they do have epinephrine and they have the vial. And so we can't do that as basics, but they can. And they'll be able to treat him much, much quicker um, than any other option. So B would be good. C, remain at the scene with the patient and request a paramedic ambulance. Why is this one wrong? We don't ever wait around. We don't ever just kind of do nothing. So remaining at the scene with the patient is not going to be your best choice. Like I've said a bunch of times, if any of the answer choices involve waiting or doing nothing or withholding treatment, they're the wrong answer choice. Uh, D, maintain the patient, patient's airway and immediately transport him to the hospital. This one at first glance looks pretty good because, okay, airway is important, and yes, immediate transport is important. However, if you look back at this idea, um, the patient's airway, from what we've been given in the question, is not inherently having problems yet. Like I said, we only know severe allergic reaction. We don't know what that is implying, uh, when I think patient's airway, like maintaining a patient's airway, I think a trauma patient that I'm having to hold an airway open or put something in their airway like an OPA to keep it open. And that's not the kind of treatment we would be doing for um, an anaphylactic patient. Maintaining their airway, we really can't do anything to maintain it. I mean, you can suction, but we're not going to assume that they're suctioning. That's going way too deep into the question. So because of that, B is the better choice. We know we give oxygen to every patient, and everything else in that answer choice makes really good sense, whereas D is a little bit funky. 145. A 60-year-old male is found to be unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic. What should you do? So when you're looking at these answer choices, you can immediately cross out B and C. Why? Okay, yeah, you don't withhold CPR, and you, if somebody is unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic, what, what do you do? What is indicated at that point? CPR. Immediate CPR. So any of these answer choices that don't say immediate CPR are wrong. So you have A and you have D. Now, for a 60-year-old male, um, your choice would be to have CPR and then get an AED as soon as possible or have CPR and transport immediately. Which one makes more sense for this patient? So remember, um, adults usually require an AED to be properly helped. It, in other words, CPR can maintain the functions of their body, the basic functions for a while, but usually it won't do much for their heart. Um, we talk about how children, usually if they're having some sort of cardiac issue, it's either genetic, which 
happens sometimes, or more likely for the, for the average child, it is because they had a breathing problem first. And the way their bodies are, once the breathing is compromised, the heart usually follows. Um, so when you start doing CPR for one of those patients, a pediatric patient, you're giving them that breathing assistance, and hopefully, or at least semi-often, you're going to have the heart start to kick in a little bit too. Adults are different. Adults, CPR is only going to help them not get too much worse, but it's not going to fix them. You want that AED as soon as possible. And can you use an AED when you're transporting, like moving in the ambulance? No. Remember, those of you guys who've done your ambulance ride outs, you're going to remember that, or if you had any CPR type patients, um, you, you would have known that they're able to hook them up to the monitor, the big box, and they're able to give shocks as they're going to the hospital in those cases. But those are completely different machines than the AED. They're much more, um, much more sophisticated, and they require a paramedic who knows what they're doing, who can read the, the rhythm and, um, and know what to exclude based on like the movement of the ambulance and things like that. They're much less fooled. AEDs can be fooled by the jostling of even just normal driving on a relatively smooth road. So we wouldn't want to transport until we'd had a chance to start using the AED. And that's why in this case, D is the correct choice. Um, now, if you don't have, well, I say this, if you're on an ambulance and you're running a basic ambulance, in other words, there's two basics, you have to have an AED on the ambulance. So you don't really talk about it in terms of what if there's no AED around. Like, there will be an AED around by definition, or you can't be an ambulance. You have to have one. Would you, like, would they know if they go into cardiac arrest while they're in the ambulance? Would you, like, pull over? You would pull over, yeah. So if they went into cardiac arrest while you were in the ambulance, you would pull over, um, someone would immediately start CPR, and then you'd also get the AED hooked up and deal with it then on the side of the road. And you definitely want to call in for backup probably at that point, um, depending how far away you were from the hospital. But since you can't move while doing the AED, you're kind of stuck with CPR. At least you do AED a few times, and if you're seeing no effect, if it's um, telling you that there's no shockable rhythm multiple times in a row, then you would go ahead and keep doing CPR and get to the hospital if it was short enough, or you would stay there and do what you could until a paramedic ambulance could rendezvous. Because we just we can't move and give the electric shock at the same time with what we have. It doesn't work. Number 146. While drinking beer with his friends near a creek, a 31-year-old male was bitten on the leg by an unidentified snake. The patient is conscious and alert and in no apparent distress. Your assessment of his leg reveals two small puncture marks with minimal pain and swelling. In addition to administering oxygen and providing reassurance, further care for this patient should include what? So let's look at the answer choices together. A says applying ice to the wound and transporting quickly. Transporting quickly is definitely good. Applying ice to the wound, though, what is that used for typically? Well, I, I, I say this. What is it used for in a first aid setting? Decreasing swelling, probably, right? What do we use it for in an ambulance? Nothing. We don't carry ice on the ambulance. We don't have a cooler full of it usually. Um, some ambulances will have a little like refrigerator or, or a cool box type thing that's usually used to hold medications, but we don't just have like extra ice lying around. So applying ice to the wound isn't something that we've ever been trained to do. Even if your ambulance does have some form of ice or cold packs on the ambulance, it's not a standard of practice thing that we do regularly. Um, a is just outside of the typical type of treatment we provide. So A is inc incorrect, excuse me. B, transporting only with close continuous monitoring. Is there anything wrong with this one? No. I mean, you want to monitor him. Um, at this point, he's in no apparent distress, but snake bites don't always act instantaneously. So you do want to monitor him, for sure. C, elevating the lower extremities and giving, giving antivenin. No, multiple problems with this one. For one thing, we've talked about how if somebody's gotten bit on an extremity, you don't want to use gravity against yourself by elevating whatever extremity that was. Um, it's not going to help you at all. It might make it worse, help the venom or the toxin move easier towards the heart or other important parts of the body. And also, do we carry antivenin on um, an ambulance? No. Um, a lot of hospitals don't even have it or don't even have the necessary kinds. So there's no way that we would have it on a bus. D, supine positioning, splinting the leg, and transporting. This actually is the correct answer. 
Um, and the reason for that is when you have a patient who has been bitten like this, you do want to splint whatever extremity has been bitten. Um, sort of along those lines of make sure that gravity isn't hurting you, you also want to make sure they're not moving too much. And so if you splint it, um, it's helping them not move too much. It's also helping control or um, try to make it where it doesn't, you, the patient doesn't have too many muscle spasms. That's kind of a side effect of the toxin is that it can cause muscle spasms. And we don't know what kind of snakes. We have to assume there might be some. So if you splint it, it's going to cause less of those or at least help control the spasms that do occur. So in this case, the answer is D. Number 147. You are caring for a 40-year-old female who is involved in a motor vehicle crash. Her husband, who is driving the vehicle, was killed. When the patient asks you if her husband is all right, what should you say or do? First off, before you even really look at the answer choices, should you lie to your patient? No. Um, should you pretend like she doesn't know what you, uh, pretend like you don't know what she's talking about? No. Um, so based on that, A, tell her that he is being resuscitated by, resuscitated by other EMTBs is wrong. It's a lie straight up, and you know it's a lie. D is also wrong. Avoid answering her questions and focus on her injuries. Um, remember, you've got a whole patient here, emotional, mental, physical, whatever, and pretending like you don't hear her or you don't understand or um, avoiding her, answer, her questions is not going to do anything good for you. So between B and C, immediately tell her of his death so that she may grieve, or C, let clergy or hospital staff relay the bad news if possible. Which one sounds better just off the top? C. And C is the correct answer in this case, yeah. Um, yes, we say that it is your job to care for somebody's emotional well-being. Um, I would kind of argue that to immediately tell your patient of their beloved husband's death is not really caring for their emotional well-being because it doesn't say anything in here about being comforting or gentle when you deliver that news it, it's just simply saying um, you know your husband died like there's better ways to do it than that um c is especially good because clergy are trained for this kind of thing especially if they're involved in a hospital um hospital staff who again are trained for this kind of thing are going to be better at giving the right kind of answers um knowing what to say also, if you tell her right away and she starts getting really upset, you've created an additional problem for yourself. You don't want to lie. You don't want to avoid her questions. If she looks at you and is like, no, tell me now, is my husband alive? You don't want to pretend like you don't know. But you want to try to not distress her further by just putting the news out there like it's not going to cause a lot of distress for her. Does that make sense? Um, so if she, if she uh, sorry. When the patient asks you if her husband is all right, um, gosh, I don't really know. That's the hard thing. I would hopefully have somebody nearby who could help answer the question. <laughs> no, like seriously, it's, it's not the easiest thing to say. Um, I guess what I would probably say in this case, I wouldn't avoid answering her questions, um, and I wouldn't just straight up tell her that he's alive. I would probably say um, something along the lines of, you know, we've got some other people here that are dealing with that. I'm really just trying to help focus on you. I don't know. None of these, it, it's hard to know what to say because I feel like I'm answering some of the stuff that's on A and D and avoiding the question. Um, I think I would probably tell her that he has passed away, but I would really try to be as comforting as possible. And that's why C says, let clergy or hospital staff for lay the bad news if possible. If there's no other option, you would have to do it. Like if she's confronting you about it, you'd have to tell. Um, Thank God I've never had to be in this position of telling somebody that their spouse is actually dead. Um, I've managed to kind of be in the background, like, working on the patient or, or the basically passed away patient, like, working with them um, and never had to deal with the question side of things. So. Yes. Uh, remember, we have a few obvious signs of death that we talk about. And um, unless one of those is there, you actually still work on them as if they're still alive. So unless that patient is decapitated, um, decomposed, um, signs of lividity, uh, rigor mortis, some of those things that we've talked about that are clear signs of death. Uh, realistically, you actually probably wouldn't have any of these here unless it was decapitation. 
because most of those signs of death are signs of death, like that death has occurred sometime previously. Um, not really like immediate stuff. So most of the time in this case, in, the, in this case, most of the time you would probably just tell your patient that someone else is working on their husband. And I know that's kind of what we were talking about with A, how A is not good. Um, but in reality, you probably wouldn't know for sure that your patient was dead, 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 because we actually can't say that a patient is dead as it EMTBs. It has to be determined by a doctor, or I think paramedics can also declare death as well. But we can't declare death, so I guess this question is sort of assuming that someone is there who could. Um, anyway, that was a really long explanation. I don't think it was a very good one, but sorry, guys. Number 148. You and your partner are standing by at a large social event at a river resort when a frantic woman tells you that she found a young male floating face down in the water. Nobody claims to have witnessed the event. After you and your partner enter the water and reach the patient, what should you do? This is just like that question we dealt with about, I guess, ten questions ago. Move him onto his back. Remember, from the question, he's floating face down in the water. Um, you can't deal with a patient who's face down anywhere, but especially in the water. You can't open up their airway or give them oxygen or anything like that. Read the question thoroughly and you'll find the only thing you can do at this point is to move into a supine position. You do want to probably secure him to a longboard because you don't know what happened and it's likely that there was trauma involved, but you wouldn't secure him to a longboard on his front side. You would still have to roll him over first before putting him with the longboard. Number 149, you respond to the residence of a 55-year-old female with a possible allergic reaction to peanuts that she ate approximately 30 minutes ago. The patient is conscious and alert, but has diffuse urticaria and the feeling that she has a lump in her throat. As your partner applies oxygen to the patient, what should you do? So, let's look at the answer choices. A says, ask her if she has prescribed epinephrine. Um, this would be a good choice because you've got a patient with a possible allergic reaction. The way to treat that is with an EpiPen. So remember, they have to have it prescribed, and you'd want to know if she has been prescribed. If she doesn't, you can't give her that, of course. So it, it's a valid question to ask. Um, B, obtain a complete set of baseline vital signs. Not a bad thing to do. You want to get vital signs for sure. Um, so that's somewhere on the list. Ascertain if she has a family history of allergies. Not particularly applicable. We're mostly concerned with her allergies. Um, whether or not her dad was allergic to peanuts doesn't have a big role in determining how you're going to care for her now. So uh, you, when we ask questions about family history, we, we like to know things like heart disease and stroke running in the family, like big, uh, diabetes, any diseases that kind of feel like big diseases that are genetic and then might get passed on, um, especially if a patient doesn't know that they have those diseases. It helps you give context for what's happening to them. If you know that your patient's father died of a heart attack when he was 42 and your patient's experiencing chest pain and they're, you know, 38, it's like, it's more of a clear sign that there may be something going on family-wise that you should really take into account. It gives a higher level of suspicion to that particular diagnosis. But it's not really applicable here. Ask her when her last allergic reaction occurred. Not really applicable here. Um, it doesn't really matter in terms of, again, how we treat our patient. Knowing when they last had an allergic reaction doesn't change how we treat them now. So between A and B, the, uh, the answer choice is A. And the reason why that is the choice is that don't just look at this as like one of those sample questions where M equals medication, even though technically it could be. Um, you also want to look at this as they're giving you a very specific set of symptoms. We've had questions like this before where they're giving you a very specific situation and they expect you to know how to treat it or how to identify it. And so in this case, you want to pick the answer choice that relates to an allergic reaction. And the best choice for that is epinephrine. Baseline vitals are important, but epinephrine will help you treat this now. And if it's going to get worse, especially with this diffuse urticaria, which remember what urticaria is? It's like a rash, like hives, which is a classic sign of anaphylaxis. And the feeling she has a lump in her throat, so her airway's closing up, another classic sign of anaphylaxis. You should be thinking anaphylaxis, you should be thinking epinephrine. 
and 150. An important aspect in the treatment of a patient with severe abdominal pain is what? We'll go through the answer choices. A says provide emotional support en route to the hospital. We've talked about how you do have to care for the emotional needs of your patient while you're patient, so maybe, um, maybe so. B, administer analgesic medications to alleviate pain. Yeah, we don't give medication to alleviate pain. The closest thing we have is aspirin, and it's, or I guess nitro as well, and they're not meant specifically for getting rid of pain. They're meant for um, hopefully treating a heart attack symptoms, like aspirin helps thin the blood, which hopefully breaks up any clots that are occurring or starting to occur, and nitro opens up those blood vessels. So they have a specific action, but they're not for general pain relief. C, encourage the patient to remain in a supine position. Do all patients automatically um, need to stay in a supine position? What if they're feeling extremely uncomfortable like they're going to throw up along with this severe abdominal pain? Would you want them laying on their back? No. For one thing, there's a chance of an impeded airway. If they actually do vomit, then all of a sudden now it's in their face and their airway and it's a bigger problem for you to deal with. For another, they just may want to be more comfortable. Usually somebody who's having a lot of abdominal pain might feel more comfortable if they're kind of on their side and curled around themselves, um, or other options that might exist depending on what's going on. But supine position is not necessarily the right choice for every single patient. D, give 100% oxygen only as signs of shock are present. Do we only give oxygen when there's signs of shock? No. Um, based on all these choices, A is then the best correct answer. You do provide emotional support in route to the hospital. All of the others are incorrect, so the answer choice has to be A.